Intelligence Testing and in Proper Perspective, the Big Picture. I'm Dr. Kevin McGrew, and I'm a school and educational psychologist. I have devoted 40 years of my career to working with, researching, and developing intelligence tests. I've learned to appreciate the power and sophistication of intelligence tests, but I've also learned that there's some misconceptions regarding the power of intelligence tests and what they can and cannot do. This brief presentation is intended to put intelligence testing in a proper big picture perspective. In 1996, Susan Edwardson wrote in an article, in an ever-changing world, psychological testing remains the flagship of applied psychology. This is true in terms of applied methodologies that can be applied to society and to problems and issues in education in particular and in other environments, the development of the science of psychological testing, the field of psychometrics, has been one of the biggest contributions that psychology has made. In 2012, an esteemed group of psychologists published the, the article, Intelligence, New Findings and Theoretical Developments. This was published in the American Psychological Association's premier flagship journal, The American Psychologist. This group made the statement that the measurement of intelligence is one of psychology's greatest achievements. This is consistent with Dr. Emerson's statement and also brings to light that within the broader field of psychological testing, intelligence testing has been the most refined and the greatest achievement in terms of technology that psychology has provided. However, they also noted that it's one of its most controversial achievements. Because intelligence testing has been so successful, sometimes it is its value and its power is overestimated by users of psychological tests and by consumers. The purpose of today's video is to put intelligence testing in proper perspective. To put intelligence testing in proper perspective, I often say we need to go beyond IQ. And I find Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems model a good conceptual framework from which to understand the value and the relative power of intelligence testing in understanding how an individual develops. Here's a classic uh, uh, representation of his system. And the major concept you have to understand here is that the, at the middle is an individual, a child, and then there are different levels of influence in terms of the family, the immediate environment, school, peers, and we can go farther out with more indirect uh, variables that influence, such as neighbors, the community, and at the farthest level out, uh, ideas and values in our culture. If you want more detailed information regarding Broff and Brenner's ecological systems model, here's some information I borrowed from Wikipedia, which defines the various system influences, and you can stop and read this page at your leisure. In 2003, Dr. Ann Maston published an article in School Psychology Review that included this figure. I was struck by the complexity of this figure, but also how it captured the major influences of, of Bronfenbrenner's big picture model. And it helped me as a researcher and a practitioner put intelligence testing in proper perspective. So I've taken that figure and I've adapted it and it serves as the primary vehicle by which I'm going to present my message in the remaining slides. A concept that is important for this presentation, since I'll be mentioning it frequently and it'll be on many slides, is the idea of proximal and distal influences. Or some other terms are influences on child development that are close and near to the child, such as the family system, parents, characteristics of the child themselves, peer groups, and distal influences, things that are farther away more abstract and more indirect, such as local community characteristics, school district policies, national educational policy. So this continuum of distal and proximal will be on most of the slides and I will be using this language throughout this presentation. Let's start with a child in a classroom in a school. So here we have, represented by the red oval, a child. Of course, there will be other children in the classroom also but it would make the diagram very complex. And that child interacts with the classroom teacher, a very important interaction. Classroom teachers are very important. That's one classroom among many classrooms in it within a school represented by the larger oval. So a child has a sphere of influence in terms of what's going, going on on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom or classrooms. They interact with certain key teachers. Each school is comprised 
of a staff, staff or other teachers, our support staff, and the building administration leadership. Each staff has its own culture, its own communication system, its own priorities, its own energies, and those influence the individual members in that staff. So this classroom teacher working with a particular child is to some degree influenced by the particular staff within the particular school in which they work. I can tell you that this is very true from spending 12 years as a practicing school psychologist, visiting schools within the same community, different schools within the same community, different schools in different communities and in different states. Each school is unique in terms of its classroom and staff and school environment, energy levels, priorities, values, etc. Let's move up a level. A school is not an isolated unit. A school is part of a school system within a local community. So I've represented that one school at this next level of distal or farther away influence as this oval within the school district. And I could put more ovals in there to represent other schools, but that would make the diagram complicated. At the school district level, we've got a school board who sets policy, allocates funds, sets priorities, tries to transmit the local community's values. So what happens at the school district level has an impact at the school level via the staff and eventually trickles into the classroom and the teacher's interaction with children. So you can see we are moving farther away in terms of influences. And we also have to remember that the school district is a part of a larger local and state community where there are different social agencies that have impact, different value systems within the community, different resources within the community, etc. The final level and most distal level of influence in the model I'm presenting here today is that of national culture. Cultures differ in terms of their resources for education, the resources for social systems that help education systems, in terms of priorities, in terms of crises or events. And a good example of how something at a national level can influence something going on at a classroom level and with teachers and children is national education policy. And a good recent example is No Child Left Behind, which had many components, one which was frequent group standardized testing for accountability and holding states and schools accountable for a certain degree of progress by students in different categories or by different demographics. As a result of this national policy, states and local communities within states and subsequently the school districts had to implement frequent group-based standardized testing and to use those results to evaluate performance of schools in terms of whether they were performing or not. So that national educational policy trickled down through these different levels down into the classroom in terms of how assessment results were used and in many cases how much time was allocated for different types of curriculum areas that would match up with the assessment tools. Let's move down and take a closer look at the child. And I've basically taken this individual child that I've been talking about in this classroom and made the oval bigger down here just so it's easier to see. In developmental psychology and in understanding human competence, we typically talk about three to four different types of competence systems within an individual. There's the conceptual, which is primarily cognitive abilities, which we measure on intelligence tests, and achievements like reading achievement, writing, and mathematics. There are practical abilities such as adaptive behavior, street smarts, common sense, those type of abilities, social, emotional, and motivational constructs, and physical abilities. A very important set of proximal or near point influence in a child is their neighborhood and their peer group. Neighborhoods differ in terms of socioeconomic status, values, crime, resources, activities for children, and peer groups and specific friendships. So here we have this child that we start off talking about in the classroom. I've made it all the larger here. And they are interacting with maybe one or two close friends within a context of a particular neighborhood. So the neighborhood has influences, peers have influences. Finally, probably the most important proximal influence on children is the family system. 
So here we have a child. We start talking about them in the classroom. Here's the child, and they are part of a family system, which can be a, a single parent family system, dual parent family system, a blended family system. So there might be more children in here represented by other ovals, but I'm only putting one. And there's interaction with, uh, within there between the parents and the siblings. And the family system has a significant influence on a child's development. Parents, some may work, some may not. And they, they go to work during the day or at night or different hours and in some type of work organization. And they have success, maybe some stressors or something that they may bring home, which might influence the dynamics of the family system. So at the bottom level here, in terms of the most proximal influences and in, in variables to consider in terms of understanding educational performance and human growth and development, we have the child with their different individual difference characteristic systems here, the neighborhood peer group, and the family system. Here we have the are at the final model, and you can see I have a pulsating circle around the conceptual domain. That is to emphasize that when we do intellectual assessment, IQ tests, tests of cognitive ability, we are sampling that domain, which is one subdomain of a child's total personal competence systems within the context of a larger system of influence that are near and far. Just the visual representation of this picture should make you pause to realize when we do intellectual assessment, although we are assessing something extremely important and some of the most important individual difference characteristics of an individual that impacts their school learning, there are many other influences. So let's take the personal competence system and blow that up a bit. Here we are talking about the conceptual domain, which includes cognitive and achievement abilities. As we can see from this, conceptual abilities are only one part of a child's total pool of individual difference variables that may influence how they perform, how they achieve, and how they move forward. To make the point even clearer, we have to realize that we have extensive amount of research on our cognitive assessment tools or intelligence tests that have shown us that they are very valuable, but they are fallible, they're not perfect. An IQ score cannot predict with 100% pre precision a child's grades or their reading achievement. It's because other abilities from the practical domains, the social, emotional, motivational, and even physical characteristics are involved and the other spheres of influence, as I showed earlier, such as the classroom teacher, the quality of instruction, the time spent on uh, learning, etc. And research has, has shown us that the best available intelligence tests can only explain 40 to 50% of academic or school achievement. Now that's a huge amount. Being able to explain 40 to 50% of school achievement is one of the biggest accomplishments that has come from the scientific study of intelligence tests. But also tells us that there is 50, maybe 60% of school achievement that is explained by other variables that are not tapped by contemporary intelligence tests. So in conclusion, the big picture. Here I've taken the diagram I've been working with, which shows that in terms of an individual child who's functioning in a classroom and how they're gonna do and how they're gonna develop over time, there are proximal influences, family system, neighborhood and peer group. A child develops their own personal competence system in different domains of conceptual abilities, practical abilities, social emotional abilities, and physical abilities. And there are influences that are farther away, more distal, but they can indeed influence what happens in terms of a person's development and in terms of their education. And the, if you look at this big picture, there's a lot going on because there is a lot of influences. And right here, in terms of conceptual domain, that's the one area we are assessing with intelligence tests. So you should look at this and have the immediate appreciation that intelligence tests, although extremely powerful and one of the, the best tools in terms of scientific methodologies that psychology has provided is only giving us a portion of an understanding of an individual. To make that point even clearer, I've now blown up the conceptual ability domain and I want to make sure we all understand that when you when you take an intelligence test or a cognitive ability test, we are only sampling different cognitive abilities. There are many cognitive abilities 
that you cannot test or you'll be testing person for days and weeks. So what we do is we sample with the individual subtests or individual tests within an intelligent battery, those abilities that the test developer has identified as being consistent with a theoretical model of intelligence and those abilities that help predict and understand how a person will do in different settings such as education or in a work environment. So when you look at this grand picture here, it should make you be humble in terms of understanding the power of intelligence tests. Yes, intelligence tests are the most important applied scientific methodology that psychology in the field of psychometrics has provided. What we also need to recognize it has limitations. We are only sampling abilities within a period of time, usually one hour to two hours, and we're only sampling one domain. It's probably the most important domain for pred predicting things like academic achievement, but other variables and characteristics of the individual in terms of practical abilities, social, emotional, motivational, and physical abilities interact to dictate how well a person does. And there are all these other proximal and distal influences that also have an impact. So this is placing intelligence testing in the big picture perspective. Think about this big picture diagram and intelligence testing sampling one component down here. If you want additional information on today's topic and related topics, visit the MindHub. Just use your search engine and type MindHub, Dr. Kevin McGrew, and you should end up at my landing page. One project that is very relevant to today's presentation is the Beyond IQ page, where I articulate and spell out the model of academic motivation and competence. Thank you.